very, very warm welcome. And I'd like to extend to you on this lovely Edinburgh morning. For the majority of you, this is a one-off event. And here you are to enjoy the masterclass that we're going to have with our honoured guest, William Urie. For a small number of us, however, this is the last day of a seven-day journey that we have had over the past week. And what a wonderful journey we have had. For those of you who are not aware, uh, we have had the International Academy of Mediators Spring Conference in Edinburgh over the past several days. Uh, and that has uh, involved a number of really exciting and stimulating, inspiring events. We started off the workshop, two workshops actually last Wednesday afternoon. We had a, a lecture by Professor Hal Abramson on Nelson Mandela as negotiator, which was really fascinating. We have what we call Bothy Suppers and the Enlightenment World last Wednesday evening around the High Street Edinburgh. We have two days of really remarkable conference sessions. This is for over 120 mediators who brought along many of them, the, the spouses and partners, uh, from all over the world, 20 different countries, uh, who are members and guests of the International Academy of Mediators. We had uh, a reception in Parliament Hall on, on Thursday. We had reception at Castle on Friday. On Saturday we had an event which for me I think goes down and I think probably does now as a highlight of my professional career. And that was sitting in the chamber of the Scottish Parliament listening to William Urey and the First Minister. And William was his customary scintillating best. For me the First Minister gave the best speech I ever ever had a gift in my life, which elevated her in Scotland to a position of statesman-likeness, uh, which was I think, welcomed by our guests from all around the world. We adjourned, not quite directly, but in due course, to the Her Majesty's Royal Britannia on Thursday evening, and then we had the opening inaugural International Academy of Media's Golf Tournament yesterday at Ely in Fife, in which our master great ball was a <laughs> uh, one of the wonderful things that happened on the Royal Yacht um, Britannia was that we completed the signing of what we call the Edinburgh Declaration um, of International Mediators. And I haven't counted, but well over 100 people have signed, mediators from all around the world have signed this declaration about what it means to be a mediator, what we believe in, and what we're committed to. I think there are copies of the text in amongst your papers on the desk. And the, the final signatory photograph of the Britannia at about 11 30, I think, from Saturday evening is William Urey. And what an honour it is for us to have his name at the top of this wonderful statement of what mediation means. And I have it done in Edinburgh, uh, where many of us have been working hard over many years to bring mediation to the fore. It's such a wonderful thing to be able to experience and to acknowledge. So that's, uh, that's the journey that many of us have been on. It, it's, it's great though, to see so many of you here this morning coming for this event and to hear William speaking. How many of you were here in 2009 in this very venue? Gosh, that's quite a number of you. Excellent. Ken, Stephen, nice to see you, and David, yeah. Um, I remember standing on this very stage and saying um, that it was, for, for me, the fulfillment of, not a lifetime dream, but certainly a many year dream since going to Harvard in 1996 to study getting to yes under Roger Fisher, William's co-author of getting to yes, the dream to bring William Urey to this country. And as I stood on this stage on that morning, it just felt to be such a, a, a fulfillment, I suppose. I remember the event was entitled Core at the Hub, which had a ring about it in those days. But here we are, eight years later, and we're here together again. And it occurred to me as I was reflecting this this morning how the world has changed. And if it was relevant and helpful to us to have William here back in 2009, that would be as relevant and helpful to have him here today. And I was just thinking, you know, the recession had just begun, the recession, the financial crash had just begun in 2008. And you and I, and Jim Mather, the then business minister of the Scottish Government, and Ian March, and then chief executive of the Scottish and Southern Energy, um, met and we talked about the upcoming Copenhagen climate change meeting COP19 with all the hopes and optimism we had back then. And my goodness me, well, I suppose they got there in, in large part in Paris many years later, but climate change remains has become even more pointed risk for us to move forward. We've got all the issues around my 
concentration is much more focused than they were back then. The Syrian war, I suppose, has become one of the major calamities since 2009, but you were talking about Venezuela. I have experienced what's happening in South Sudan, where there are millions of people either dead or dislocated because of the internal violence of these communities. And then we think about Brexit, uh, which we would not imagine that we would really think in 2009, and very few of us would have done. We were both well, well in advance of the Scottish independence referendum, and you were well in advance. In fact, you were just elected by Barack Obama, and who would have thought in 2009 that his successor might be at last become Donald Trump? It's extraordinary changes in a relatively short period of time in human history, certainly a relatively short period of time in the history of this planet, and yet posing for us crucial, crucial questions and challenges. So it's a, it's a timely return, William, and I, and I want to extend to you a very, very warm Edinburgh welcome. Um, one of the uh, occasions on Saturday following our events in the Scottish Parliament chamber was the conferring of an honorary degree by the University of Edinburgh on William and I had the honour to give the laureation. I don't propose to go through all of Matthew here. Here's one Matthew just does not need an introduction and uh, I will not not do that. But um, we have a, a very interesting day. We've got a morning which we'll hear from William talking about getting to yes with yourself and will be some of his some of these books available to a purchase if you wait at lunchtime. Well, I should mention our stars. This Sunday, the encouragement to think about things for purchase. This, believe it or not, is the International Mediator Star. Launched last week, specially designed and woven for our conference. It's called International Mediator, or International Academy Mediator, so we can use all sorts of events like this. There are still a number of them for sale. Andrew Burnett will willingly sell them to any of you who'd like to have yourselves adorned with these scarves. Uh, at any stage, Sunday at the Royal Mile was stopped yesterday wearing it, and the tourists said, Where did you get this? It was wonderful. There are only a number, a few of them available, folks. <laughs> 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 Moving on. Um, getting the yes of yourself. We, we, we will talk about that this morning. There will be an opportunity for some interaction and reflection, because, of course, getting the yes with yourself is very much a reflective process, much of a discursive one. In the afternoon, you and I will have a conversation, and we'll talk about what's going on in the world. We'll, we'll try and focus on some of the constitutional issues that are occurring in this country. Um, we will talk about William's work not only in Colombia, but Korea. And those of us who heard him mention the work on Sandy in the Parliament will look forward in anticipation to hearing more. I've had the privilege of hearing much more, and it is a fascinating story. Uh, what's going on behind the scenes and about the role of the third side. So we'll, we'll do that in the afternoon. We'll also hear from Gabby, William's daughter, who is here with us as our honoured guest. Gabby, you're very, very welcome. Lovely to meet you and get to meet you, to meet you again and get to meet you. So that's it. The day will unfold in, I hope, a reasonably informed way. We'll improvise a bit. We'll see what happens. Uh, and we'll enjoy ourselves enormously. So, as I say, no formal introduction from me. But on this occasion, I introduce William Urie not as a stranger, but as a friend. And I'm just delighted to be able to do so. And we look forward to hearing from you. So thank you, John. It's an enormous pleasure to be back in Edinburgh, back in Scotland, and, uh, and to talk about what I think is perhaps the greatest challenge that we today in our communities, in our families, in our governments, in our societies, and in our world face, which is how do we deal with our differences constructively rather than destructively? And I think that issue is as, as important, if not more important, than when I was here last time in 2009, as, just, uh, as John was just mentioning. Um, I'd actually like to begin, actually, with a quote from Adam Smith, which I think is really the theme of the day, which uh, goes, uh, uh, the first thing you have to know is yourself. A man who knows himself, a woman who knows herself, I would say, can step outside themselves and watch their reactions as an observer. Because what I hope to talk about with you today and to really engage in conversation about is uh, this question of how do, we, how do we influence other people? That's really the art of negotiation, is influencing other people. See if we can persuade them to change their minds, perhaps. 
And the best instrument we have is ourselves. So the question is, how do we tune our own instruments? How can we get to yes with ourselves in order better to get to yes with others? And that's the question I'd like to pose with us this morning. Because I've found that that's really the foundation. I found that actually the, the, the biggest, I guess, lesson I've learned over the last 40 years of being wandering around the world, run around the planet in very, many different kinds of conflicts, from family feuds to business disputes to governmental disputes to wars of various kinds, is uh, the biggest, uh, the, our biggest opponent is the person that I look at in the morning, every morning, and we all look at in the morning which is ourselves, which is our normal human tendency, as Adam Smith put it, to react, to act without thinking. As Ambrose Bierce once put it, when angry, you will make the best speech you will ever regret. <laughs> and I think that's more often than not. And the question is, how can we turn that biggest opponent into our biggest ally, really? How can we become our own biggest ally so that we can be then of maximal service to ourselves and in particular to others around us, to our communities, as we seek to grapple with the very difficult issues that we face in today's world. I'd like to begin, if I may, with a story that perhaps many of you may have heard me tell before, but I, it's uh, one of my favorite stories that I think illustrates this point. It's, uh, I, I, I've done a lot of work in the Middle East. That's an old story from the ancient Middle East about a man who passed away and left to his three sons 17 camels. And to the first son, the eldest son, he left half the camels. And to the middle son, he leaves a third of the camels. And to the youngest son, he leaves a ninth of the camels. Well, the three brothers get into a little bit of a negotiation. And it turns out not to be so easy because 17 doesn't divide by 2, and it doesn't divide by 3, and it doesn't divide by 9. So they get into a quarrel, and the brotherly relations start to get strained, and violence is even a possibility. And finally, in desperation, they consult a wise woman. She thinks about their problem for a long time, and Mike comes back and says, well, I don't know if I can help you, but I happen to have a camel. Would you like my camel? And so they say, fine. So then they have 18 camels. Well, 18, as it turns out, does divide by two, so the first son takes his half, half of 18 is 9. The second son takes his third, the third of 18 is 6. The youngest son takes his ninth, the ninth of 18 is 2. If you add 9 and 6, you get 15, plus 2, 17. They have one camel left over. They give it back to the wise woman. Mm -hmm. If you think about that story for a moment, I think you'll find that it resembles a lot of the difficult negotiations that we get involved in. We often start off with 17 camels. No way to resolve the situation. What that woman does is she steps back to what I call the balcony. Like we have a balcony above here, which is a place of perspective, a place of calm, a place where you can see the big picture, a place where you can focus on your genuine objective. You can keep your eyes on the prize. And that's really what I'd like to focus with you with on this morning is how do we negotiate from the perspective of the balcony, from the perspective that Adam Smith calls the observer, the one who can observe their own reactions, so that we can actually act proactively in pursuit of our best interests, rather than, as I often find in conflict, we lose sight of our best interests and we get involved in destructive disputes. That's really what I'd like to talk about now, negotiation, the way I would define it very simply and very broadly, is simply the act of back and forth communication. You're trying to re reach agreement with the other party or other parties, and you have perhaps have some interests which you hold in common, like an ongoing relationship, perhaps, uh, like between Scotland and Britain. And you also have issues in tension, like around the question of the evolution of constitutional powers. And the question is, how do we reach agreement under those challenging circumstances? So I'd like just to ask you, if I may, just a few questions about your own experience as negotiators. So the first question I have to ask is, uh, if you think about your day, who do you find yourself in negotiation with in the course of your day? 
wouldn't mind just calling it out just to see what the variety here there is in the room. What do you negotiate with in the course of your day? What'd you say? Your wife. Your wife, your spouse. Okay. Spouse at home. Your kids. Okay. Other team members. Other team members. Myself. Yourself, of course, right. Uh, that's right. What else? Who else do you negotiate with? Who else do you find yourself having challenging, perhaps, negotiations with? Clients. Okay, clients, for sure. Who else? Your boss. Other drivers on the road. Other drivers on the road when you're driving. Okay. Who else? Excuse me? For some people, God, you're negotiating with God. Actually, yeah, they actually, they actually, you know, one of one of the projects I've developed over the years is called the Abraham Path, which is a little bit like the Santiago de Compostela in the Middle East. And God had this negotiation with uh, Abraham had this negotiation with God, in which he was trying to save the city of Sodom and Gomorrah. It's really, maybe, the, maybe the earliest recorded negotiation we know about. And he said, you know, he, he he dared to negotiate with the most powerful authority to save. For the sake of human rights, really, for the sake of justice, I said, "Are you going to destroy this city? What if I could find, uh, you know, fifty righteous individuals? Would you still destroy it?" And God says, "No." And so Abraham says, "Well, what if I could find forty-five? <laughs> and God says, "Well, maybe I would spare it. How about forty, <laughs> thirty-five? And he finally bargains God down to the to, to ten. But unfortunately, Abraham can't even find ten. So unfortunately, those cities are destroyed. But it's a it's a an early example of negotiating, as we often do, from a position of inferior power with someone with much greater power. And that's one of the questions we can deal with today: is how do you deal in an asymmetrical situation? As I understand, you know, um, as I was reading about Scotland, for example trying to negotiate with the UK right now around Brexit, uh, with the UK government, it's, it's a, it's, there's an asymmetric power. How do you negotiate in those kinds of situations is something we'll look at. Who else do you negotiate with? Friends. Your friends, okay. Your friends. So if you think about for a moment, uh, anybody else you negotiate with? That you find yourself negotiating with? Your your employees. So you negotiate up with your boss, you negotiate down with your employees, you negotiate sideways with your colleagues, your friends. We negotiate in every which way. If you were to make a ballpark estimate of how much of your time, if you think about your day, how much of your time you spend negotiating with your spouse, your children, your boss, your colleagues, your employees, your clients, drivers on the road, yourself, if you had to assign a percentage, what percentage of your time do you think you spend negotiating? What would you say? Anyone? 10%? 10%? Okay. Anyone higher than that? 50%? 80%? Okay, how, how many of you say, I, I negotiate uh, at least 10%, at least 10%. Okay. Keep your hands up if it's over 25%, over 50%, over 70%. So you can see that uh, whatever the percentage is, it's a huge portion of our time. We don't always think of it formally as a negotiation, but at least in the informal sense, a back and forth communication trying to reach agreement we were negotiating from the time we get up in the morning to the time we go to bed at night, not to speak of negotiating at night with ourselves during our dreams and so on. So we're, it's, it's a process we're continually engaged in. Now, if you think about the past 10 years, for example, as you perhaps advanced in your career, you've assumed more power and more authority, would you say that the amount of time that you spend negotiating is about the same as it was 10 years ago? Has it gone down over time? Or has it gone up? What would you say? About the same? How many would say it's about the same? How many would say it's gone down over time? How many would say it's gone up over time? Take a look at the hands. That is, I think, a universal experience. And that, this is what I've found over the last 40 years wandering around the planet and traveling 
just the last few weeks, I've been in Korea, I was in Colombia, I was in the United States, now here I'm in Scotland, and many different continents. Whatever country I go to, I find that there is a, there's a revolution taking place around the world. And it's a quiet revolution. It accompanies the knowledge revolution. It, it accompanies the internet revolution. And it's a revolution in the way in which we as individuals, we as organizations, we as societies, the way in which we make decisions. Because traditionally, a generation or more ago, perhaps the most common form of, of decision making was things were pretty much organized quite hierarchically and the people on the top of the pyramids of power gave the orders and the people on the bottom followed the orders. But now increasingly, what we're finding is those pyramids of power beginning to collapse into organizations, organizational forms that more resemble networks, where essentially the basic form of decision making is horizontal decision making. It's moving from, hor from vertical towards horizontal decision making. And another name for horizontal decision making or shared decision making is negotiation. Hence, why you know, the great majority of hands go up, we're negotiating far more than we were ever before. We're having to negotiate across borders, we're having the, the complexity, but we're perhaps the first generation to have to negotiate as much as we can. So we're in the infancy of trying to figure out, are there better ways to negotiate? Because today, in today's world, everyone wants to have a say. People don't want to be left behind. They want to, they want to have a say in decisions that affect them. And so the question is, how do, we, how do we do that? So it requires a kind of creativity, the same kind of creativity that we put into better technologies like, like phones and smartphones. We need to put into the soft technologies of human relationship. How do we do that in today's world? That, to me, is one of the real challenges. Let me ask you uh, one more question. Think about, you're all decision makers, and you are leaders, really. Um, think about the 10 most important decisions you had to make in the course of the last year. How many of them could you make purely unilaterally, just by yourself, you make the decision? And how many of them did you actually have to reach with other people, with someone else, with other people, through some process of shared decision making that we might call negotiation? Of the 10 most important decisions you had to make in the last year, how many of them, in effect, did you need to negotiate? What would you say? What would you say? All of them. All of them. How many would agree with that? Almost all of them are all of them. So this is what we're dealing with, is that negotiation has become the preeminent form of making decisions. So the whole question is, how do we do it well? And it's not easy at all, of course. It's not easy. Uh, it's often extremely difficult. And the, and the uh, how do we do this? How do we, how do we engage in this process? How do we learn to become better negotiators? You know, the thing that's always struck me is that, um, is that if you were, uh, uh, you know, since we negotiate maybe, some say 25% of our time, 50%, 75% of our time, if we were engaged in our favorite sport, be it golf, or be it uh, swimming, or be it tennis, and we were engaged in 75% of our time, we might be in the Olympics. The question is, as good as we might be as negotiators, why aren't we all in the negotiation Olympics? And I think the answer to that question lies in the fact that when we negotiate, we put almost all of our attention on the outcome. What is the outcome? What is the agreement? What are, you know, the, how much money, what are the terms of that agreement? When we engage in our favorite sport, we always have part of our attention focused on the process, you know, on the swing, the golf swing, the tennis swing, our technique. And if we can learn to become what I would call reflective negotiators, in other words, negotiators who reflect, who are slightly detached, who are on the balcony, we're able to observe the play. It's almost like you're on the balcony and here you are, the negotiating is taking place on the stage. Who can reflect on it? 
then we have a chance to learn. So that every single day, we have so many chances to learn. So for me, a reflective negotiator is someone who's continually learning. I find myself I'm continually learning. Every single day, that's what I strive to do. Um, and that's what I think. Back then, that's the way to get into the negotiation Olympics, is through that reflective process, which is why it's so useful to have a day like we do have right now, which is a day on the balcony in which we can reflect on our own negotiations. So what I'd like to invite you to do, uh, John has made up a, a piece of paper here. Where was it? Uh, 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 there it is, right there. You have a piece of paper in front of you. Um, and I'd like you, I think you're going to get a lot more value on the day if you can reflect on at least one challenging negotiation that you are currently facing. It could be a situation at home. It could be a situation at work. It could be a situation in the community. It could be a situation in the larger society. But uh, if you think about it, there, there's some questions here. So I'd like you to just take a minute or two to fill out this sheet. Uh, the first two questions, uh, which are, what difficult situation would you like help with? That's the first question. And what makes it difficult? What are the obstacles in the way? You wouldn't mind just taking a minute to fill out those first two questions on that sheet. I think you're going to get a lot more value out of the day as we talk about some general principles or specific techniques. If you have in mind one situation at least, maybe you'll pick more than one, but at least one situation, perhaps a situation you wouldn't mind sharing with a partner next to you, uh, because I'd like us like us to have that chance to work through at least one situation, and I think, I hope that you'll, by the end of the day, you'll have a better, maybe some different ideas, some different approaches about how to deal with that difficult situation, and I think it'll generate some interesting questions as well. So just take a second to fill out those first two questions. What's the situation, and what makes it difficult? your negotiating situation. Think about it for a moment. Who are the parties? What's the issue? What's the tension between what you want and what they want? That, let me just ask you a <coughs> question. If there are, if you could generalize and say there are two kinds of negotiations that we encounter in life. One are the external negotiations with people outside of the organization. Let's say it's clients, for example, or drivers on the road, or, or providers, or you know, if you're negotiating with the government or banks, you know, external you know, external negotiations. And the other are internal negotiations, inside, inside the family, for example, with your spouse and children, or inside the organization, with your colleagues, your boss, your employees. How many out of, just out of curiosity, <coughs> have selected an external negotiation as a challenging negotiation that you chose to focus on? You've taken an external negotiation. <coughs> How many of you selected an internal negotiation? Okay. So interestingly, uh, I would say there's a, obviously both, they're both have been selected, but there's quite a significant majority of selected internal situations, which leads me to the next question, which is, if you had to make a generalization, uh, which of those two types of negotiations do you personally tend to find more challenging? The external negotiations, or the internal negotiations? How many of you find external negotiations more challenging? How many of you find internal negotiations more challenging? Look around you. Now, isn't that interesting? Because the internal negotiations are with people with whom supposedly we're part of the same family, we're 
part of the same organization, we're part of the same team, and yet, paradoxically, those are often the most difficult negotiations. And so that, for example, if you take, uh, uh, I find, for example, those of us who are work, work in family businesses, for example, if you take the internal dynamics of a family, you superimpose them on the internal dynamics of a business, you can get some of the more complicated negotiations. And interestingly enough, what I find is if you ask yourself the question of what could possibly be more internal than yourself, in other words, there's this paradox of the more internal the negotiation, the more challenging sometimes it can be. Uh, which is why even if you look around the world today at conflicts, even uh, the violent conflicts, the great majority of wars today take place within countries, not between countries. It's the ethnic wars, it's the civil wars. Those are the ones I find myself mostly working on. I just came back from working, uh, I've been working for the last uh, seven years as, a, as an advisor, senior advisor to the president of Colombia, Juan Manuel Santos, taking a civil war that had bedeviled that country for 54 years. 54 years, there was hardly anyone alive who, who remembered what it was like to live in a time of peace. And I remember when he called me and <coughs> first sat down, most people would have given maybe 5% odds that this war would come to an end. Uh, it, just, it just seemed so, everyone was, it, so many attempts had been made, everything had always failed. And yet I watched and participated uh, over, make, making over, I just, my last trip last week was my 25th trip to Colombia, was just watching and participating in this process of watching a seemingly absolutely impossible, intractable conflict tied up with drugs, kidnapping, 250,000 people dead, 8 million victims of this conflict. No family in Colombia was untouched by this conflict. And to watch it slowly, patiently, with so many setbacks, so many failures, move to the point where last year the, the guerrillas, the, the FARC, uh, finally laid down their weapons and are now entering the field of politics. And it seemed impossible. Now we're in the middle of the implementation of that agreement. And this is one thing I've learned, too, about negotiation, is that uh, we think negotiation comes to an end when you reach an agreement. But actually, that's only the midpoint of the negotiation. Because there's the entire implementation of that agreement. And oftentimes, agreements, I find, they break down during the implementation phase. So, so, and now Columbia is struggling with that implementation process of how do you implement, how do you put an end to a war that's been going on for 54 years? It might take a generation to really heal the wounds and to really start to integrate them. So it's, we're talking about things that are extremely difficult, but it's the internal negotiations that are often most difficult. And interestingly, in that conflict, what I found universally is that however difficult it was for the government to negotiate with the FARC guerrillas, and I went to meet both sides uh, and spent time with them, the most difficult thing was the negotiations inside the government. They were more difficult than negotiating at the table with the FARC. And the same thing I would say for the FARC. Oftentimes, it's the internal negotiations. So however difficult it is, I think, for for, for example, uh, the UK to negotiate with Europe around Brexit. It's the internal negotiations within the UK government that are even more difficult than dealing with the Europeans. And so we're dealing with that challenge. So today we'll talk about both internal and external, but it is interesting that the more internal, the more difficult, which is why the theme this morning is dealing with the most internal of all negotiations which I find is that if we, can, if we can be successful in that and getting to yes with our own selves, it will facilitate our ability to get to yes with others. It will facilitate our ability to help others get to yes if we're, if we're mediators. Uh, so that's the key to me, is the first and most important negotiation that we ever have to deal with is the 
one that starts within. Uh, that's the key. Um, and it's been it's a long time coming, because yes, I've, I've specialized in, uh, in dealing with ne difficult negotiations, because I, I was based at Harvard and you know, writing about negotiation, but I wanted to get real life experience, so I used the world as my laboratory, wandering around the world to the most difficult situations, working on the Cold War <laughs> between the United States and the Soviet Union in, uh, in the Middle East, the Israelis and the Palestinians. I worked in Syria, I worked in Chechnya, I worked in Yugoslavia, I worked, you know, just uh, seeking out the more, most difficult situations to see what works, what doesn't work, what makes these things so difficult, uh, and how do we possibly overcome what are seemingly intractable differences. So the key is, what I found is that if we can get to an inner yes inside of ourselves as negotiators, as mediators, then that's what facilitates the outer yes. So what I'd like to do is, uh, is just talk with you a little bit about that process. I mean, um, John uh, was just mentioning uh, Nelson Mandela, who to my mind is one of the great negotiators of the last uh, of the last generation, really. But he didn't start off as a natural negotiator. He was a boxer, but he was a fighter. But when he went to, into prison and spent 27 years in prison, he writes about it. And he talked about. He started to write and talk about how the most difficult negotiation he had was inside of himself to try to learn to control his own natural tendency for anger, for reaction. And what did he do in that jail? He learned about himself. He did what Adam Smith called on us to do, which is to know yourself, to know your own reactions, to go to the balcony, to observe your own natural reactions. And what's the first thing he did when he was in prison besides that? Is he started to learn the language of his enemies. He learned Afrikaans the language of his jailers. He learned the history of the, of the Boer people, of the Boer War. He learned their trauma. And all of that served him enormously by learning to get to yes with himself. Then when he emerged from jail 27 years later, he was able much more effectively then to speak to his enemies in their own language, knowing their own history, evoking their own traumas, and was able successfully to persuade them to bring apartheid to an end. He wasn't a natural negotiator. Another one from the world of business is uh, Steve Jobs. As you know, he was a very volatile uh, character who, who reinvented, really, you know, the, the world of technology and everything that we have today. And he was also just a, but he, he uh, early on, you know, he founded Apple Computer, and then, uh, and then because of his kind of wild, impulsive behavior, he was expelled from Apple Computer. Uh, he was expelled, as, as you may know his story. And he spent many years kind of in the wilderness, but he spent time learning about himself uh, during that time, uh, taking long walks. He liked to walk. And, and, uh, and when he came back to Apple Computer 10 years later, uh, he was still, you know, we still have the same kind of personality quirks, but he was, he knew himself more. He knew himself more such that Apple Computer was then in a very precarious state. It was about to go under. And the only way he could save Apple Computer was to make an alliance with his erstwhile enemy, his opponent, who was Bill Gates of Microsoft. And, uh, and they were kind of like bitter rivals. But he went to Bill Gates and asked Bill Gates to invest in the new Apple. And in particularly, he asked him to develop a form of Microsoft uh, Office for Apple, which was something they weren't interested in doing. And only by doing that was he able to rescue Apple. So, and, and I remember that he had a meeting, there was a meeting in which uh, he, all the Apple people were there, and he brought in Bill Gates by video conference, and everyone booed, you know, booed, you know, 
Bill Gates, Microsoft was the enemy. He said, no. He said, look, you know, for Apple to win doesn't mean that Microsoft has to lose. You know, he shifted, he reframed the game from a win-lose contest to both could benefit to the point that, you know, that they became friends, actually. They became friends uh, rather than enemies because he had done that in trouble work of getting to yes for himself. That's the key. Um, so, so essentially, as I try to think about it, I'd like to, you know, I, uh, I'm known, getting the yes is known for, you know, something called interest-based negotiation. What I'd like to propose is now is to go one step beyond interest-based negotiation, which includes interest-based negotiation, and think of it as balcony-based negotiation for a moment. What does it mean to negotiate from the balcony? What does it mean to negotiate from a place of calm and perspective where you can keep your eyes on the prize, which is something as, as Mandela did, which is to, you know, a South Africa that would work for people of all races, as Steve Jobs did, which was, okay, even if we're business rivals, we can still find ways to cooperate. How can we, how can we work together in this new technological revolution? And that's, so essentially, what I'd like to do is just propose a little bit of a framework here where you start with a negotiating with yourself, which then allows you to uh, negotiate with the other. Uh, so you start here with yourself, negotiate with the other. And you start here with a shift in mindset. That's what we're talking about, is an initial shift in our mindset, our underlying assumption which then leads us to a conversation about interest-based negotiation, which then leads to options. And so I'd like to take us through these six steps, as it were. And as I do so, I would like to invite you to take your own situations as we go along this little journey and apply this framework to your own situations to see if we might get some insights into your own situation. Um, before we do that, actually, um, what I'd like to do, if I might, um, just because I want to make today as, as, um, as tailored to your needs as possible is, with your own situations in mind, what I'd like to do is make a quick list of, of questions that you might have. Uh, you know, what are the obstacles? When you wrote down, what makes your negotiation difficult? What were the kinds of things that you came up with? Just so that I have those in mind so that I can weave them through the course of the morning here. What were the, what are the biggest obstacles that you see to success in your own negotiations? And I can just make a quick list. If you could just call out a word or two words or three words. So you kind of get a sense. What is it? Time. Time. Okay. So time is one. Expectations. Expectations is another. Different priorities. Anxiety. Anxiety. Relationships. Relationships. Access, to the right people. Access to the right people. Power place. Power place. I'm sorry? Hostilities. Facilities? Hostilities. Hostilities. Hostilities, of course, yeah. Kind of emotional hostilities, okay. Culture. Culture. Lack of clear communication. Lack of clear communication. Psychology. Not knowing what they want. What actually do they want? I'm sorry? Differences in values. Okay. So it's not just differences in interests, it's differences in values. Trust. trust. There's distrust. Lack of trust. Very common, difficult negotiation. Fear of displacement. The fear of displacement. Okay, fear of displacement. Dealing with irrational people. Dealing with irrational people. Okay, that's good. Well, what was that? Power imbalance. Okay, those are good. Okay, that, that gives me a, a good sense. Then we'll try and we'll try and uh, and also. Uh, 
we'll, we'll have time for questions, and particularly this afternoon, but even today during the morning, I want to make this as interactive as possible and really address your concerns. Okay, so let's start off with, uh, with, with balcony for a moment. Um, so the whole idea of the balcony is that the uh, is that the the uh, in, in balcony based negotiation here for a moment, and we'll just take that. The challenge is the biggest obstacle, of course, to getting what we want in negotiation turns out to be ourselves. It's our natural tendency to react, to act without thinking, and the truth is. That we can't, you know, you know, if negotiation about influence, we don't have a hope of a whisper of a chance of being able to influence the other if we're first not able to influence ourselves. That's the key. Is that mastery begins with self-mastery. If we can't master ourselves, it's going to be very hard to master others. Uh, and uh, uh, if I might just give uh, an example. Um, uh, so from some of my negotiations, uh, um, many years ago I was uh, involved as a mediator, as a third party, between the government of Russia and the government of Chechnya. Um, and they were involved in a terrible civil war, as you may remember. And, and we had the very first meeting between the two sides um, in The Hague. In, a, in the Peace Palace there in The Hague. In fact, in the very room where the, it was back in the mid-90s, where the uh, war crimes tribunal was taking place for Yugoslavia. And the, the person representing Chechnya happened to be the vice president of Chechnya. And the negotiations got off to a very bad start because when the uh, Chechen delegation took off from their capital, Grozny, they were, uh, as they tried to fly over of Russia. They were surrounded by Soviet MiGs who threatened to shoot the plane down. So when they arrived, they were in a rather disgruntled mood. And uh, the uh, vice president of Chechnya began the conversation. At the table there, he said, and he pointed to the Russians, and he said, you should stay right here in this room because you're going to be on trial for war crimes. And then he began a whole long, perhaps hour-long disquisition on the whole history of the traumas of che the sufferings of the Chechen people at the hands of the Russians going back at least three centuries. And uh, the whole history of accusation after accusation. And then he noticed me and he said, oh, you're an American. Let me tell you what you Americans are doing. First of all, you're supporting the, the Russians, he said, you know, President Clinton is supporting Boris Yeltsin. He said, but I want to tell you what you're doing in Puerto Rico. And he went on about Puerto Rico and how the Americans were oppressing the people of Puerto Rico for, for at least uh, 10 minutes. And then he turned to me for reply, and everyone, all the eyes of the 30 people around in the room sort of looked to, looked to me, and I was trying to think, what do I know about Puerto Rico? What, 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 what exactly are we saying Puerto Rico? It's very easy to kind of like lose because he was, a, you know, he's criticizing. So it was very easy. But then I, I somehow remembered to go to the balcony and remember the thing that you're supposed to remember, which is why are we here? And so I, I uh, had the, the balcony perspective, and the translation gave me a little bit of time to think for a moment. And that's what's in such short supply in negotiation is time to think. And I, I said, uh, I said, I understand, I hear you, I hear the suffering of the, uh, of the, of the Chechen people, I hear the whole story. And, uh, and as to Puerto Rico, uh, I'm glad to hear you, you know, I take your criticism of my country as a sign that we're among friends, because only friends can really criticize each other and tell each other the truth, and I appreciate that, but we're here to try to stop the suffering of the Chechen people. And I kind of moved the spotlight right back to, to from Puerto Rico back to the Chechen situation. And then we began to talk about how to bring about a ceasefire, which eventually came about uh, a few days later. 
But it was just, to me, it's, it was an example of how easy it was. Because like, my mind was going to Puerto Rico. And what did I know about Puerto Rico? But that's often what we're doing in negotiation. Is we're you know, you're talking, a husband and a wife are getting into an argument. You know, the, the, it, it, and it goes off in a totally different direction. And it's so easy in negotiation, I find, to lose sight of what the prize is. What actually is the prize? What are you trying to get at? And that's what I find is so important about ways to go to the boundary, whether it's on the spot. Is it's so easy, even though negotiation is supposed to be rational, goal-oriented behavior, what I often find is uh, people act in ways that go directly contrary to their own interests. Uh, because we get deviated, we get we, we get into point scoring, and we forget what the what the actual issue is about, and that's the importance of being able to go to the balcony. So let me just ask you, if I may, um, think about it for a moment in terms of um, there are natural reactions when we are under when we're in a difficult situation. One is to fight back, to respond in kind. Very, very common reaction. When you are attacked, we tend to attack back. And as you know, uh, you know, as Mahatma Gandhi once said, "An eye for an eye," and we all go blind. And that's what often happens in, in negotiations. Uh, or we might, you know, get so upset we just break off and walk away. And if that's our client, if that's our boss, if that's our spouse, and we just walk away, you know, maybe that doesn't actually solve the problem either, uh, which, although a very natural human reaction. Or a third very natural reaction is we give in. We just accommodate. But that, of course, doesn't serve our interests either. So the natural human reactions of fight, flight, or, you know, give in, surrender, usually do not serve our own interests. So the question is, how can we go to the balcony and think proactively? What's a proper response that advances our own interests in the negotiation? That turns out to be the key. The key is this ability to, to go to the balcony, to imagine that we're negotiating on a stage, and go to a <coughs> mental and emotional balcony, which is a place of perspective, a place of calm, a place of self-control. It's a place where we can keep our eyes on the prize. I mean, if you think about it even in physiological terms, um, and I've noticed this in the world today, as I travel around the world in this last uh, year, I, uh, uh, last about 15 months, I, you know, I've, I've touched into the whole issue of Brexit, you know, uh, which is an extremely complicated negotiation. We went from there to Catalonia, which of course involved another whole mess. It went from there to Colombia, and then went from there to the Middle East, uh, and then went from there to Myanmar, and, uh, and Korea, and, and dealt with Russia, and then dealt with Iran. And everywhere I go, there's so much polarization. The levels of anger and outrage and fear are so high that what you find is, is people are, are go into a hyper state of, of, of stimulation where the, the sympathetic system, the nervous system gets so excited that, you know, in my own country now with the people who are against President Trump and the people who are fervent supporters of President Trump, there's so much our nerves, everyone's nerves are on edge. And so we go into a hyper state. And then you can't sustain that. And so a lot of people then descend into a hypo state, which is paralysis, resignation, numbness. There's just too much going on. You know, uh, whether it's, you know, as, as John was mentioning, with climate change. You know, people get sometimes very excited about climate change. You know, the world is really changing, extreme weather and so on. Or we go into, it's just too much, I can't do anything about it, and we just go into hypo. In negotiation, what the most effective place to be in our nervous systems is in between here, as it is, in, uh, psychologists call it the you know, optimal zone, or the zone of tolerance, it's sometimes called. And actually, in the nervous system, it's, 
There's a nerve called the vagal nerve that actually calms us down, brings us back. We're, you're neither hyper, not hypo. Yes, we have normal emotions. Yes, we have anger. Yes, we have fear. Yes, we have anxiety. But they're within certain tolerable levels that we can use them. Emotions are enormously important. This is not about suppressing your emotions. Because emotions are the information. They give us critical information about our environment. We need to learn to read our emotions. But if we let our emotions get out of control, then our emotions are controlling us instead of us controlling our emotions. So it's important to have those emotions. We need those emotions to really be able to read our environment. They often tell us when things are wrong. I mean, how do you know, for example, um, if uh, someone is lying to you in a negotiation, is that you get this feeling in your gut. It's kind of almost like a physical feeling, like there's something off here. So we need, we don't want to disconnect ourselves from our from our bodies and from our emotions, which are extremely important sources of information. But if from a balcony perspective, it's the ability to read our own emotions. But if we're in the hyper state or the hypo state, hypo state where we you know we don't even we're, we're no longer we're, we've lost contact with our emotions. We're just kind of in a state of uh, apathy, as it were. And you find this collectively. If you look at our, our collective, there's so much apathy in the world today. And there's so much hyperstimulation. And the internet plays this role of, because all the times now you get this news, this traumatic, you know, all this Syria, what's going on here, what's going on there, and then you just close down. So you're either in hyper or hypo. And our ability to manage our own emotions so that we can stay in an optimal state, which is a state where you can actually act effectively, where you can listen to your own emotions, where you can listen to the other side's emotions, where you can tolerate ambiguity. It's that, it's that middle zone that we need to learn to cultivate. And as leaders, we need to learn to lead our organizations and our societies to help them stay within that optimal zone, because that's the zone where you can effectively deal with issues and deal with problems. And that, to me, is one of the great challenges, which is why balcony-based negotiation turns out to be so key. So let me just ask you, if I may, uh, what are your favorite ways to go to the balcony? Uh, if you wouldn't mind just uh, uh, writing down for a moment, write down one or two, or perhaps three. What are your favorite ways in the course of the day? How do you bring yourself into that optimal zone? How do you like to calm yourself so that you are at your best? You are in the zone, what athletes call the zone when you're when you're the best, you, you can give your best performance in a particular negotiation. You can show up at your best. What do you do? What, 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 everyone has their favorite techniques. If you just write down one or two or three of them to think about what you might use in your own particular situation, the one you just mentioned. What are your favorite balcony techniques? Just write down one or two um, techniques that work for you. Because what works for you may not be what works for someone else. And then let me just uh, see if you wouldn't mind just calling out a few of them just to see what the variety of, of methods are. For me, for example, if I might just add one, uh, I mean, one thing I love to do is to go for a walk. I love to go for walks, particularly in nature. And here, Edinburgh, I've noticed, is like the most beautiful city with so many the meadows and the gorse. It's just like, it lends itself. I'm not surprised that the Scottish Enlightenment took place here because there's such a rich combination of urban community and, and the beauty of nature. What, what, what do you use to kind of calm yourself down when you're, when you're in a difficult negotiation? <coughs> you swim. Okay, so this is some kind of activity, swimming. Music. music. Music is another thing. It just gives you into a different modality, for sure. What else? Meditation. Meditation. Yeah, meditation. Just taking a moment of silence, just silencing yourself. Uh, I, I find that very useful, too. Before I go into a negotiation, just take a few minutes of silence just to calm my mind down, calm my emotions down, 
Remember what's important. Breathing. Breathing. Absolutely, because what does breathing do? Because essentially, when we get into the hyper state, uh, uh, particularly, you know, the blood tends to flow out of our brain to our extremities because we've got to be ready to fight or flight. Breathing brings oxygen back, brings, uh, allows it, calms us down, calms down the sympathetic system, activates the vagal nerve. What else can do? What else do you do? Excuse me? Make a cup of tea, exactly, a cup of tea. Get, being grateful, absolutely, yeah, being grateful, this kind of thing, calms you down. What else? Journaling. Journaling, exactly, writing them down, giving the expression to those emotions. Because but when you journal, you're actually putting yourself some distance between that. You're putting it down on paper, so you're putting yourself on the balcony. You become that witness that, that Adam Smith was talking about. You witness your own, become the observer of your own reactions, the observer of your own emotions. Well, a sque squeezing putty, exactly. Yeah, exactly, something like that. Exactly, something physical like that. You know, uh, I was uh, saying when we were in the Scottish Parliament, I was telling a story about how uh, I was, uh, I was in a meeting with uh, President Chavez once in, in Hugo Chavez in Venezuela, and, uh, and he was shouting at me and just uh, like for about 30 minutes, uh, this absolutely, you know, in front of his entire cabinet. And, uh, and, uh, and I, I remembered something physical that someone had taught me, which was simply, which was to pinch the palm of my hand. And, and, the, and this fellow here not at all. So this pinch the palm of your hand. I said, why am not? He said, because it'll give you a momentary pain. It'll keep you alert, you know. Just something physical like that to remind you of your body, to embody yourself, can kind of bring you, can ground you, can center you. Yeah. What else? Reaching out to someone who can listen well. There you go. Use someone else as your balcony. You know, it's interesting because I, I, I often sometimes have trained uh, hostage negotiators. You know, the hostage negotiators who deal with, like in big cities, deal with hostage situations. They never negotiate alone because it's so easy to get emotionally identified with the situation. They always have a partner or other people who can serve as their balcony, who can kind of say, hey, you're a little bit, you're getting a little bit off, you know. So listen, someone who can listen to you can help you calm down and serve as your balcony. You know, it's interesting in this situation in Colombia with President Santos, uh, he once said that to me, he said, what's the, what, 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 uh, there was myself and there were a few other advisors. He said, you are my balcony. You know, you, you can listen to me, you pay attention to me. Because everyone else is coming at me all the time. So when he's trying to, to negotiate an end to this war, he needed such people to, to listen to him. What other, what other techniques do you have? Those are good. Self, self. Humor, of course, yeah, humor, absolutely, can kind of like, uh, just take, it can, it can shift the mood, you know. Humor, absolutely, in, in, in a good situation like that, yeah. So there are many, many ways to just to kind of like, just change perspective. That's what it's, you know, psychologists call perspective taking. Just change, change our perspective, which help us go to the balcony. Okay. So then, uh, from the balcony for a moment, um, the next step here is to, um, is from the balcony, from that mindset, now we can do something, you know, we can negotiation, we talk a lot about, you know, uh, perhaps when people ask me what's the most important skill of a negotiator, you know, I, I always say, you know, it's the ability to put yourself in the other side's shoes, because after all, negotiation is an exercise in influence. You're trying to change someone's mind. How can you possibly change their mind unless you know where that mind is, is put yourself in their shoes. But what I found is it's actually hard for us to put ourselves in the other side's shoes. It's actually difficult to do that, particularly in a very difficult situation like the ones that we face. And the key prerequisite to being able to put yourself in the other side's shoes is first, oddly enough, to put yourself in your own shoes. 
And that's the key to be in negotiation, is to put yourself in your own shoes. And that's what you do on the balcony, is, as Alan Smith was, you learn to observe yourself by journaling. You learn to put yourself in your own shoes. What am I feeling? What's going on inside me? You know, when President Chavez was shouting at me uh, during that time, you know, you know, you know, my, my instinct, my reaction was to defend myself. He was saying, you're naive, you're, you, you third parties are not seeing all the crazy tricks those traitors are up to and so on. He was just like furious, you know, uh, leaning very close in my face. But then I was able to put myself in my own shoes and say, hmm, I'm noticing. What am I noticing? I'm noticing my cheeks are reddening here. I'm thinking, okay, a year and a half work down the drain feeling embarrassed, I'm feeling a little anxious, I'm feeling like reacting, like no, I'm not naive, and so on. But by essentially putting myself in my own shoes, noticing my own emotions, then instead of my emotions controlling me, I could begin to control my own emotions. And then I could settle down and just listen to him, bite my tongue and listen to him. And, uh, and by doing that, by just listening to him for about 30 minutes, and this was a man who was known for giving speeches for eight hours, and I'm sure he could have given a speech for eight hours. By after 30 minutes of not, not of just paying attention to what's going on inside of me, by listening to myself, I was better able to listen to him. And then after about 30 minutes, he began to run out of steam, and his shoulders sank, and he said, uh, at the end of it, he said, so you're here, what should I do? So, you know, he, his, his mood shifted. And that's the key, is, the, is one of the greatest powers we have in negotiation is the power not to react. That's the ability to go to the balcony. So, uh, so that's what you want to do. Now, what you want to do from the balcony, put yourself in your own shoes, is to really focus on what's truly important. You know, someone mentioned values. Where, what are, what are your true values in a negotiation? So what I'd like to do for a moment here is just ask you for a moment to close your eyes for a second. Just close your eyes and point your, point your arm in the direction that you think north is. Where's north uh, for you right now? Just, just close your eyes, point, point your arm where north is, okay? Now, keep your arm up and open your eyes, and you'll see that everyone is pointing in very, very different directions. <laughs> Look at this. Some people are pointing this way, some people are pointing that way, some people are pointing that way, and I'm just looking at my compass here, and north is over here. <laughs> now, that is an illustration of just how easy it is to get disoriented in negotiation. We don't know where our own true north is. Our own true north, where our values are, how do we orient ourselves? That's what happens, is we get disoriented. And the whole idea here in negotiation is because we need to stay rooted in what's important to us. Let me give you an example, if I may. Um, a few years ago, um, I got a call from a woman uh, who's a very prominent uh, entrepreneur in in Brazil, and she said, could you, uh, could you help my father? He is perhaps the most prominent, best-known businessman in Brazil. He's 75 years old. He and his father started with a little bakery, a little Portuguese bakery in Sao Paulo, Brazil, and they built it into the largest supermarket chain, not only in Brazil, but the largest retailer in all of Latin America. Uh, extremely successful, and, um, and they made a, a partnership with a French supermarket king, uh, uh, it was a company called Casino, which is a big uh, French supermarket thing, and, um, and they're having this huge boardroom battle about control of the company, and it's been going on for three years, it's all over the papers, uh, they've hired just about every law firm you can imagine in London, in Sao Paulo, in New York. Uh, they're fighting this out in the courts. Uh, they're, uh, they're, they were literally spending 
I believe tens of millions of dollars fighting each other. I mean, that's how it was. Uh, there was character assassination. There was corporate espionage. People were telling me they were afraid for their lives, and so on. This thing had gotten so out of control. I mean, the the, the president of, uh, of Brazil was speaking about it with the president of France. It strained Franco-Brazilian relations, and she said, "Could you help?" And I thought, "Well, I don't know. If I can help. I mean, I'm not usually doing these kind of commercial things, but..." But I, I said, next time I come to Sao Paulo in a month or two, I'd be happy to at least meet with your father. And so uh, I, I met with him, his name was Emilio Diniz, and uh, I went to his home. And uh, he was uh, uh, 70, he was 76 at the time. He had uh, he'd married again, he had young children who were just running around, two young children, one was five, one was three or six, or whatever, anyway, they were, and I, and I their father is just consumed with this conflict. What kind of father can he be to these kids and so on? And uh, but I asked him this question, you know, because for me it's all about balcony, you know, like like can we go to the balcony here? Because here's a company with 150,000 employees, we provided loyalties. The thing was just blown completely out of proportion. The Financial Times actually, the Financial Times and the Financial Times said this was perhaps the largest cross-continental boardroom dispute in history. I mean, it was really kind of like, it was, it was shaking the, it was, and uh, so I asked him, I said, uh, um, from a balcony perspective, I said, so Abidio, tell me, what is it that you want? You know, what are your interests? You know, what, what is it you want? And like a very smart, intelligent, very, very successful businessman, he said, I know exactly what I want. I want you know, a billion dollars in cash, and I want, uh, I want uh, the company headquarters, and there's a, there's a uh, uh, non-compete clause in, in the contract in over three years, and I want it eliminated. I want the company headquarters. I mean, you know, about like six things. Those are his demands, which is how we usually approach a negotiation. These are our demands. And, and lawyers have been going at it for 18 months trying to negotiate, got nowhere. And so then I said to him, but Abilio, you know, you're a man who seems to have everything. You've got your own private plane, you fly around the world, you're there, you can have any life you want. What do you really want? How, what do you want with your life? I mean, after all, what, what do you want I mean, behind all of that? What's the prize? You know, you know in your shoes, from a balcony perspective, what really matters to you? And he paused and he struggled with that question. And finally, he said, oh, you know what I want, William? He said, I want libertade, which in Portuguese means I want freedom. I want my freedom. That's what I want. And, and I could tell it by the tone. You know, it, it wasn't the same tone as I want a billion dollars or I want the end of the not compete clause. I want Libertad, I want my freedom. And for him, I knew, because I had studied his history, that had a particular resonance because 20, perhaps 30 years earlier, uh, he had been leaving his apartment, you know, the garage, coming out of the garage, and was surrounded by cars. And uh, he was a man who was a fighter. Boxer and, and, and he even had a gun and whatever, but he was surrounded by uh, kidnappers who were urban guerrillas who were uh, who, who took him hostage, and they held him in a coffin for an entire week uh, with just some air holes in it. And this is a man who prized control and he loved control. So you can imagine being held in a coffin; you're never going to survive being held in this kind of coffin. And, uh, and only by pure chance, pure divine grace, did the, uh, somehow the police find that, I know, I found an abandoned vehicle and, and, some, and somewhere in the car engine they found a, uh, uh, a business card and the business card was for a garage. And they went to the garage and then they were able to track it down. They were able to find the place and they were able to free him after a week which he attributed to the, to the intercession of Santa Rita, who's the, uh, the, 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 the saint of impossible causes. 
Anyway, he was free, but I knew that freedom for him had a particular resonance because this is, he was feeling like a hostage of this situation, an emotional hostage of this conflict, which had consumed his life for three years. Every board meeting was just a shouting match. And uh, so freedom, as soon as I heard the word freedom from them, I thought, you know what? Maybe I could help him. I said, I said, I don't know if I can get you your billion dollars. I don't, you know, I don't know if I can get you all that stuff. You know, I'm not, uh, I'm not even a trained lawyer. I mean, whatever it was, I was just, I said, I don't know if I can do it, but maybe I can help you get what you most want, which is your freedom, your psychological, emotional freedom. And I asked him, what would you do with your freedom? You know, what would you do with your freedom? And he said, well, if I was free, I would spend more time with my family, which is the most important thing to me. And he pointed to his kids. His wife was there. His older kids were there, too. They came for lunch. He said, I would spend more time with my family. And then I would also do what I love to do, which is I love to jet around the world and make big deals and mergers and things like that. That's what I would do if I was free. Uh, so then I decided to take on the case uh, to see if I could help him. Um, but what was interesting to me was the key there was I was helping him. I was on the balcony. I was helping him go to a balcony because he was so in a reactive state of fighting, you know, thinking he had to fight. Remember once he said to me, well, maybe it's just my life. I just have to fight for the rest of my life because he, had, he was going to be chairman of this company for another eight years until he was 84. I think it was just going to be another eight years of fighting. And uh, I said, well, maybe that's my fate. It's just a fight. And uh, the question is, was there an alternative here? Did they have to live with all that damage, not just damage to him and to his family, but to 150,000 employees, to commercial relations between these two countries, and so on? Not to speak of uh, you know, all the money that was being wasted in, in this gigantic struggle with with, between lawyers, and uh, uh, so so it was freedom. So my question for you is: in your own situation, to go back to your own situation for a moment, is in the in the difficult situation you just picked. What is the what is it that you want? You know, someone mentioned. You know, I, sometimes I don't know what the other side wants. I think the first thing is to know, what do you want? What do you really want? What is your objective? I can see Theresa May, for example, this is an example. You know, what does she want? Or what does the UK actually want in the Brexit negotiation? What's the number one objective? What is it they really want? So I'm asking you, in your own situation, what do you really want? What's the What's the equivalent of freedom for you? What's the, what's the root value? What's the root deed? If you had to put it down in a word or two, what do you most want in that situation that you're currently faced with? So just take a moment and write that down if you would. This is something I find so often in negotiation is like my good friend Emilio, 
he thought he knew what he wanted. It was about money and, and non-compete clause and company headquarters and concrete things. But behind that, what did he really want in life? What was truly important to him? What had deep emotional resonance? What was he really fighting for? What did he most want? So I'm asking you that same question. Say no to the wrong solutions 
in this case, and just to be able to say no because I'm putting food on my family's table, that would give them the strength to say no, and instead then offer the customer, look, there's an off-the-shelf solution here that we can adapt and we can tailor to your needs. And that's what helped them, and I think that's what we all need to do. It's so like my friend Emilio, we have to go beyond what we say we want to really ask the question of what is it that we really want? Because that's the purpose of negotiation. The purpose of negotiation is to go for what you really want. And if we can really get to that, you know, uh, listening to, uh, to uh, uh, Teresa Sturgeon, uh, I mean, I'm Nicholas Sturgeon. <laughs> oh, yeah, Teresa May. That's, that's a good slip right there. Yeah. Nicholas Sturgeon the other day, you know, it was like when I was listening to her, I could see, you know, but there's something about, um, you know, you know, the surface thing is we want independence, right? But why do you want independence? Why do you want independence? It's something to do with self-determination, the ability to shape your own destiny, the ability to have a voice, to really kind of try to go behind what people say they want. For what is that deep human? Everybody wants to be able to shape their own destiny. They want to be able to have a voice. There's something about dignity in there. So you kind of really listen behind the layers of uh, of, of what people say, because you know, the, you know, independence. You know, I remember once um, with uh, many years ago, um, I was sitting down with a guerrilla group um, that had been fighting for 25 years for the independence of uh, of Aceh, which was, is a province of, Indi of Indonesia. It's a place where the tsunami actually hit most strongly, um, and this was before the tsunami. And, uh, and I was meeting with, the, with all their leaders who had been fighting for 25 years, thousands of people dead, whatever. And, uh, and I said, so what do you want? And they said, well, we want independence. That's what we want. That's what we've been fighting for. And, uh, and I said, uh, I understand that. I said, that you've been fighting. And what do you think the chances of you getting independence are with the Indonesian army being as strong as they are? They said, well, you know, they could see that, you know, they could, they weren't going to get it anytime soon. It might be 10 years. I said, so, but tell me strategically, why do you want independence? Why do you want independence? Why are you fighting for independence? And there was a kind of a stunned silence around the table with all these leaders. And I realized that here they were fighting for something, but they couldn't quite answer why they were fighting for it. Because I said, is it, I mean, is it, are you fighting for, um, is it, is it, you know, do you want your own parliament? Do you want, you know, the political autonomy? Is it economic control of your natural resources? Do you want a seat at the UN? Why do you want the independence? And they struggled with that question, but then as we kind of shaped it and I brought out what their underlying interests were, they realized that then that actually began a conversation that they had not had as a movement, which was recognizing, recognizing that for them in that particular situation, strategically, what would best serve them, recognizing that militarily they were unlikely, highly unlikely to achieve their goal of independence. I said, don't surrender your goal of independence. Don't surrender your goal of independence. But how do you advance your underlying interests in self-determination, in having in being able to, to, to affect the fate for your own people? They wanted cultural independence, to be able to put children in their, their own language to practice their religion the way they wanted to practice it and so on. That's what they wanted. And so they had this big debate within the movement around whether or not to carry on the armed struggle or whether or not to try to do it through, through democratic autonomy. And they were then, uh, a number of years later, finally able to negotiate that. They had a vote, uh, a democratic vote, within the province. And, and, the, and the governor and the vice governor turned out to be leaders of, this of, the, of, of the movement. 
Uh, it, they didn't, and, and when the, I said, they didn't have to abandon their long-term objective of independence, but they actually moved, they advanced, they got economic control over their natural and oil gas resources off their coast, they got political autonomy, they got a lot of cultural autonomy and so on, and they moved in the direction of what their strategic objectives were without having to surrender what their long-term objective was. They could move along that continuum. And I think that's, that's why it's so important to be able to go to the balcony, put yourself in your shoes, and understand what are your real interests are here. Because negotiation isn't always about advancing your position. You know, independence was a position. But what's the interest behind it? What, what are the core human needs of dignity, of voice, that need to be advanced? How do we do that today and tomorrow without even, you know, without abandoning anything? But just how do we move in that direction? Given the strength and leverage that we have, what can we do to move in that direction? That, that turned out to be the key for them. Uh, so that's, that's the core of um, keeping King asking yourself. Sometimes I find it, you know, ask yourself five times, you know, why? Why? Why do I want that? Why do I want that? Until you get to that bottom layer, which a lot of you did for, you, for your own situation. That's the key. So then, um, let me come to the third thing, which is, okay, so where does the power come from, come from, in order to be able to advance and secure and protect your core interests of confidence, of stability, of security. Where does the power come from in negotiation? Now, as we know, uh, uh, you know, a key concept here is a, a concept, uh, a, a acronym that Roger Fisher and I coined many years ago, getting he has called your back, which is, you know, that. Power comes from many things, of course, but perhaps the greatest source of power is the power of having a good BATNA. Your BATNA, as you recall, is, your, is just an acronym standing for your best alternative to a negotiated agreement. In other words, it's like a fork in the road. Either you go towards agreement or you go towards your BATNA, which is your best course of action if for some reason you are not able to reach agreement. And it turns out that one of the great mistakes we make in negotiations, we go into negotiation, we just try to go for agreement, and we haven't really thought through what our back is. What are we going to do if for some reason we are not able to reach agreement in that difficult situation that we all face? Because BATNA turns out to be a source of power, a source of confidence. Because if you have an alternative, then you are not the hostage of the other side. You're not desperate to reach an agreement with them because you have an alternative. And oftentimes that alternative can be improved. Just give you an example. There was a, a, a Zen master having a, a, you know, conducting a class in Zen, Zen Buddhism, and they often teach with that kind of paradox. So there was a student there in the class, and he was uh, <laughs> sipping a cup of tea and the Zen master came along with a big stick and said to this student, he said, if you drink that cup of tea, I will beat you with a stick. And if you do not drink that cup of tea, I will beat you with a stick. Now, you're the student. What do you do? How many of you, how many of you thought, I'll drink the cup of tea anyway, right? How many of you had that idea past you? Right? Okay, that, that, that's you know one of the typical responses to superior power. If you have no control, you might as well enjoy the tea, right? Uh, and that, it, probably the second most common one is you know I'll fight back, right? How many of you had the thought I fight back if someone's about to hit me with a stick, right? So that's the second. But those are two. But that those are two backnuts in that situation. But what else could you do? What else could you do in that situation? Yes, in the back. Yeah. Offer him the cup of tea. Offer him the cup of tea. OK. What else could you do? You could take the stick. 
Now, see, the, taking the stick is an interesting idea because you could just kind of grab the stick because that's essentially, if you think about these as classes of behavior, taking the stick isn't necessarily being aggressive. You're just removing their ability to, to hurt you, right? You can take the stick. So, for example, I don't know if, uh, if, uh, if, for example, you were you were selling something, and, uh, and you have a client, for example, and the client is always asking you to cut the price and whatever, and and the, and the and the client's stick is, if you don't give me what you want, I know your boss. I play golf with them, and I'll, you know that's their stick. You know what you can do is you can meet with the boss beforehand, and you say, look, I've been to this movie before. This is what happens. I try to hold the line, and then he comes to you. And so if you want to have that client, <laughs> you can deal with that client. But if you want me to deal with a client, send the client back to me. Then when the customer pulls out that stick and says, I know your boss, you can say, please, feel free to call the boss, knowing your boss is going to back you up. You've just removed the client's stick. You know, that's one possibility. What else could you do in that situation? Ask them why. Ask them why. Why they want to beat you, right? What else could you do? You could pour the tea away. Okay. What else could you do? What else could you do in a situation like that? You could leave it alone. You could invoke hierarchy and uh, invoke justification. Uh huh. You, so in, in involve. Legal. In, it could involve a sort of legal. Legal thing. You could threat, threaten to sue them, maybe. <laughs> okay. Okay. Some kind of legal. What else could you do? You could laugh at them. Offer what else? Share the tea. You could share the tea. Ask him you could ask him what he wants. What else could you do? You could throw the tea at him <laughs> in his face. What else could you do in a situation? Remember, this is a situation we often face. How many of you face situations of asymmetrical power, where you have less power than the other? Okay, so it's very common. Okay, so what else could you do? You could what? Spit on the stick. I'm sorry? Spit on the Spit stick. Spit on the stick. Okay. okay. You could what? Leave the room. Okay, exit. You know, exit is one thing we should always consider is what's our exit strategy? You know, run. Uh, you know, exit. You know, you can exit the situation. That's a you know, classic way. Okay, we can exit the situation. We can remove ourselves from, from the danger. Okay. What else could you do? That's just that. What else can you do? Anything else? Yeah. Yes, please, in the back. You could form partnerships with other people and kind of... Right. Absolutely. This is one I was looking for, which is like... I think it's interestingly, in a situation... Uh, okay, great. Wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so what you could do is... Uh, is ally yourself. Remember, if you're, you're a student and there are all these other people in the room. The master is more powerful with the stick than the individual student. But if you say, help me, fellow students, solidarity, suddenly you have a mass of students and the students are more <coughs> powerful than the master. You can form a coalition. And that's something that I think we ought to think of doing sometimes in situations where asymmetrical power. How do we build a more powerful coalition that can level the playing field, balance the power so we can have a more equitable negotiation? So improving our BATMA turns out to be key. So that's what we want to do is we want to improve our BATMA. Now, now I want to just leave you with one thing, which is, because um, I see that uh, John has written a coffee break in his second year. <laughs> So, so you can develop your BATNA, which is your best alternative to a negotiated agreement. But what I want to suggest to you is people find it very difficult sometimes to develop a BATNA. And I, I notice this time and again, sometimes we forget to do it or, 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 or we think we have no BATNA and so on. But what I want to suggest again is that there's something called an inner BATNA. We always focus on the outer BATNA. And the inner BATNA is your own commitment to yourself to take care of your needs. That's your inner BATNA. It's what can you do to take care of your own 
needs in that situation. Uh, it's almost like an iceberg. You know, there's the outer batman, but underneath of it is the inner batman. Let me go back to my friend Abilio for a moment. When he told me that he wanted freedom, and it was freedom to be with his family, it was freedom to make deals, I asked him a question. I said, so Abilio, tell me, who has the ability to give you your freedom to spend time with your family? Who has the freedom to give you the ability to make the deals you want? Is it your arch enemy, the owner of Casino? Is he the one who's depriving you of your ability to spend time with your family? Is he the one who's depriving you of your ability to go out and make deals? Or is it you? Do you yourself have that ability to do that? And that was like an aha for him. Oh, we are hostages in our own minds. And if we can change our own mindset, so he thinks that, fine. I don't need to fight this all the time. He went on a vacation in the, I don't know, the Aegean Sea on his yacht or something with his family for a couple of weeks. He decided to do that. He moved his office out of the company headquarters and began to look for other deals. So even while we were, he was carrying on the fight, he went after his own prize. So who can give you confidence? Who can give you that clarity of conscience? Who can give you security in the end if it's not yourself? And that's the key. Is the key to Batna is there's an external batna, but the internal batna is only something you can provide. And if we can realize that, then we have more power in the negotiation. And curiously enough, I would say, paradoxically, because Abilio was able to take care of himself, take care of his own needs to be with his family, because he was able to start pursuing his own deals, he relaxed a little. And it was that degree of relaxation that allowed us, in the end, to make an agreement. Because as long as you can see yourself to be a hostage of the other side, either you're going to give in to them much more than you should. The key is, uh, as a friend of mine, uh, Herb Cohen, once said, he said, the key is in negotiation is to care, but not too much. That's the thing. You want to care about things, but not too much. Because if you care too much, then you surrender your power to the other side. In the end, inner batna is about reclaiming your own power. It's asking yourself, how can I get what I really want? Who, in the end, can give this to me? How can I access my power? And it's really it's about owning your life, owning your relationships. Who is responsible for your relationships? If you put blame on the other side, every time you blame the other side, you give power to them. You're saying you have the power. When you take responsibility, when you own your own needs, when you take self-responsibility, what is self-responsibility? It means I am responsible in the end for meeting my own needs. If you can take that inside yourself, Self-responsibility, the ability to respond to the situation, no matter how much the other side has victimized you or abused you, if you can take self-responsibility, you reclaim your own power in that situation. And then you're going to be a more effective negotiator. So essentially then, where that brings us to is, uh, is those first three things of yourself. The mindset of your balcony, the interests of putting yourself in your shoes, options, your inner batna. And then uh, now we're going to take a break. And I'll just, before we take the break, in terms of balcony, I have a friend who's an emergency room surgeon. And he is dealing with situations where there's panic all the time. Someone's being wheeled in, they've been shot or knifed or someone. Uh, the, Blood is flying everywhere. Nurses, doctors are in panic. And his favorite way to go to the balcony 
is he walks into that room, and the first thing he says is, where's the coffee? <laughs> and everyone stops for a moment and looks at him as if he's crazy. He's the head doctor. Someone here is in peril, dying of a thing, and he's asking for a cup of coffee. He says, yes, but they all give me their attention. That's the key thing. They all give me their attention. And then as soon as I get the coffee, I say, where's the scalpel? And then I get them from being in a chaotic, disorderly way of dealing with the situation back to step by step, how do we save the patient? So on that note, I'm going to ask you to step out, grab a cup of, cup of coffee, and go to the balcony. We'll come back in 15 minutes. Well, you know what? You have options. You know, spend time on your co in your coffee chatting with people, being on the balcony, but you can get back in here pretty quickly. My suspicion is you'd rather listen to William Uri on this one occasion than talk to each other. So let's begin 10 minutes, shall we? Okay. Which will inevitably become 12. <laughs> 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 <laughs>